JamesAllen.com is the online destination to easily design a customized engagement ring and save up to 50% compared to traditional stores. You pick a diamond, whether it's lab created or earth created, James Allen has over 200,000 conflict free stones. Then you pick your ring setting and metal. And if you need some help, they have real time diamond consultations available where an expert can walk you through it all. Get 25% off your order at JamesAllen.com code podcast. That's JamesAllen.com code podcast. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150. Bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same game parlays. Find bets in the new Explore tab. Make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way to find popular parlays, and more. So visit fanduel.com slash 247 and make your first bet a layup. Fanduel, official partner. Of the NFL. Must be 21 plus and present in Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, permitted parishes only, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, or Wyoming. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. Visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia or call one 800 522 to 4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24/7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope ny in New York or visit oasas.ny.gov/gambling. Standard text messaging rates apply. Sports betting is void in Georgia, Hawaii, Utah, and other states where prohibited. Welcome to the PowerCat podcast. GoPowerCat.com's Kansas State Athletics Show. Make sure you're subscribing to our show at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, from the GPC studios, here's your host, GoPowerCat publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to another edition of the PowerCat Questions podcast. Back in the studio, returned from Arlington. Tim Fitzgerald, Zach Carlson, and Cole Carmody, he is your podcast team. Zach, are you uh, are you still Wi-Fi'd out? Are you in the club right now? In the club right now, but we'll the, old, see. the old man is, is trying to tell the young man, just restart your technology. It always fixes it. But he's not doing it. It's funny because that's what I told you on Twitter. <laughs> yep, exactly. Exactly. You won't have to restart this podcast because it's going to be flawless. <clears throat> There's no wood to knock on. Yeah, it's all laminate in here. Composite. Knock on dude's head. It's kind of made of wood. We are sponsored by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. Make sure you stop into the fridge every time you're in Manhattan. It's at the corner of Claflin and Westport. Mm-hmm. God, I got it. Man, that's the end of the podcast. Good talking <laughs> to you. I hope we answered all your questions. Yeah, stop in the fridge. Wonderful people, great selection, credible service. They'll help you with anything uh, you need. In fact, I, I, Mike gives good back rubs. Just saying, just go ask Mike for a back rub at the fridge wholesale liquor. Do we got good questions this week? Pretty good. Do we I got, like them. Do we got stuff that will enable us to take shots at, at Ryan Gilbert? Mm, no. Nope. Not in the questions podcast. Okay. Well, Gills, you're still, you're still on my checklist. Got to take care of you. On with the questions from Wabash Station. Here's Cole Carmody. The first question comes from O2 underscore Cat. Which of the four incoming schools will end up being K State's biggest rival, and why? 
I don't see any of them really forming a rivalry, mostly because we just it won't be the same. You don't play them every year. Nobody will play each other every year unless they eventually get to a rival scheduling format. I, I guess if I had to pick one, I mean, this, but this is more from the Kansas State side. Cincinnati probably doesn't care, but that 95 game at Cincinnati in Nippert Stadium was so formative of the Bill Snyder era that it kind of strikes me that going back there will be cool, but guys, that was 28 years ago. What the hell? I mean, nobody my age remembers that game. Yeah, I know. So, I mean, if you stop and think about UCF already has existing rivalries with, with Cincinnati and and uh, I mean Houston to a lesser degree. Houston has roots with the Southwest Conference teams that they'll pick those rivalries back up. Cincinnati and West Virginia are kind of engaged um, in a small rivalry. So Cincinnati actually enters with two rivals. BYU would be the one that's an outlier, but they've already got something kind of cooking with with Baylor and TCU. There's a you know particularly Baylor, but. I can see some other ones going on there. I I just don't see K-State from this grouping of picking up um, any kind of natu- natural rivalry unless, you know, something with a meeting in a championship game really turns into something special. I mean, think about K-State's quote-unquote rivalry with TCU. Right. I think mm-hmm. that that is about the extent that any opponent of these new four that K-State could possibly have. I think BYU is probably just a – one of those teams where you're like, I like playing them. The fans are nice. The location's nice when we go to Provo. Finally get to I th- go. I think it's going to be one of those types of teams. I think Houston is probably just like a meh. It's Houston. We have to go to Houston. You know, I don't think there's going to be anything there. I think Cincinnati maybe could be that championship type game. But if I had to pick any team, it's probably UCF. Huh. Just of how, you know, they're a young school. They're a young football program with a huge rise. I think that, you know, just the growing alumni base, everything about UCF, I think K-State just as, you know, from a fan base as a whole, I don't want to say as jealous, but you look at how well that school is doing as a whole and you look at it as a K-State, you're just like, wow, I could, I wish we could have that, you know, or at least a sliver of that, of just that meteor, meteoric, meteoric, yep, meteoric okay. rise. Mm-hmm. Nice space thing, too. I know. That's nice reference. Um, you know, especially the, the K-State fans that like new uniforms <laughs> and... A little bit of jealousy. And think that uh, Nike just doesn't have time for anything ever, and it's all because K-State just doesn't want to plan anything Mm -hmm. but yeah i think (laughs) there's a lot of things you can look at with ucf as a university as a whole as a k-state fan and say you know what why can't we do that i like that i'm going to approach this from a different angle as far as programs go specifically from a football aspect and i'm going to say houston and i'm going to say houston because of the recruiting impact um k-state and houston especially if you're houston right i don't know what the trajectory of that program is with dana holgerson like let's just let's just sit, call it how it is with tom herman that program was on the rise then they got dana holgerson and they had some success but recently it hasn't been as nice if they can continue to rise, then they're going to start to pull in some more recruits. And Dana Holgerson talked about this at Media Days. He wants to get more Houston kids to stay at home, and staying in the Big 12 might help them with that. Well, if K-State wants to be competitive, they're going to have to go down into Houston to recruit. Right. That's just how it works. And so they're going to be going up against Houston for some recruits a lot. I mean, they have in the past, but now with Houston being in the Big 12, you're going to see t- kids top eight, if they're from Texas, that includes Kansas State, TCU, Houston, Texas Tech. Like That's probably going to be a standard top four. Um, so K-State is going to have a natural natural rivalry there with Houston. So I'll say from a recruiting aspect, I could see how Houston could kind of maybe start to be a little bit more of a rivalry, especially between coaching staffs if they start to get it rolling. But as far as football, actual games go, you mentioned, Zach, like a, like a Big 12 championship rivalry. I would say UCF just because I do think that that team is um, – that program is kind of more on an upward trajectory than Houston is at the moment. But from a recruiting aspect, I could really see Houston and K-State getting in some battles. Okay, let me unpack some of the things you guys said. Uh, First of all, I think the TCU thing was actually rooted in Gary Patterson. I mean, the commonality of having Coach Patterson at K-Stater there and the purple thing. So I think there was some under 
toe there that now is really gripped hold with the the on the field, the great games. UCF is a fairly believable scenario for a couple of reasons. First of all, they've got a history of playing here. They've done it before in a very memorable game. Again, so long ago, a lot of young fans don't remember the storm game, but it was very memorable to all of us there. And the photo was just stunning. Um, but also because of Gus Malzahn. He played here with Auburn and said this was louder than SEC venues. So I think when UCF comes, he's going to talk about that. I've been there. I've seen it. This is not an American environment. This is going to be something totally different for our guys. So maybe there is something there. Uh, but I also, you got to stop and look at it from their standpoint. It's kind of like dating. You can think they're a rival, but if they don't think you're a rival, you're not a rival. And until, you know, Nebraska K-State had a thing going and until Nebraska finally got their teeth kicked in a few times, it wasn't a rivalry because then it got the attention of their fans and they got so upset they left the conference and ruined their program. K-State wins. Anyhow, um, I I don't see Houston seeing K-State as a rival, maybe on the recruiting trail. I like your point about that. But they're still going to have the historical ties to those three other Texas schools, and that's going to heat up. I I don't think there's a natural rival in this round of expansion. And the next round, maybe there will be someone that, you know, somehow K-State and, and uh, the new school get gets entangled. But um, even the schools they're talking to, maybe the closest would be Colorado, simply because they won't have Nebraska anymore. Kansas State's kind of taken that role as Nebraska in this conference, and it will be geographically the closest, I would guess. I would guess. Maybe love it. I don't know. But um, I just think there's some history there that maybe if they come in, that'll that'll be something that gets reestablished. But I don't know. I From a rivalry standpoint, uh, I think it's clear where I stand until UNLV comes in this conference and I cause a, a, a crap show in Vegas I, and erupts an entire rivalry between cities. This is not going to happen. Big 12, please make it happen. It's all about fits. I know it is. I'm glad you finally realized. How long have you worked for me? <laughs> <laughs> Next question comes from Big Sam. What is the biggest trap game on K-State's football schedule this year and why? Probably UCF. I mean, right out of the gates. You know they've got that thing scheduled. Can it be considered a trap game if it's the first conference game of the year? Yeah, because we're not talking about it enough. Yeah. I think UCF could be pretty good. And they, everyone keeps asking me, is there a team of the newcomers that could sneak up and really be a factor? It's got to be UCF just based on the level of athletes they can access in Central Florida um, and how good those players can be. But, yeah, uh, you know, I mean – TCU coming in isn't going to sneak up on anyone. It doesn't seem like a trap. Going to Texas, that doesn't seem like a trap. Texas Tech going down there, that doesn't seem like a trap. I think we know what's coming. Um, but maybe UCF, because of all that going on around us, um, becomes that game. Does Kansas become the trap game? Do the fans look past them and maybe Jalen Daniels plays out of his mind on that day? I mean, are we talking a trap game for the fans or are we talking a trap game for the program? <laughs> Because yeah. I think there's two completely different it's answers. Not, it's not going to be a trap game for the players. Though. It's not going to be a trap game for the players. And you look at the first three games of the season against SEMO, that's not going to be a trap game. It's opening night, the family reunion, as everybody talks about. So you're not going to see a slip up there. I don't think you'll see a slip up in week two against Troy either, just because of what happened against Tulane. I think that these guys are fully locked in on, hey, we got to come and play our game 100% of the time or else you'll get beaten. And so I don't think Troy is a trap game. Obviously, Mizzou, there's going to be some motivation behind there. So I, I can't see them looking ahead to Big 12 play. I don't know if a road game, your first conference road game, is a, can be considered a trap game. But I look at Oklahoma State as maybe that game to where, you know, they could very easily have a loss or two at that point. Um and K-State could be undefeated, probably should be undefeated. And so maybe that's a game where K-State's ranked in the top 15 and Oklahoma State's unranked. And it's not really um, nationally thought of as much. K-State's probably a, an eight-point favorite in a game like that. So, yeah, that, that that would be my answer. And I've kind of circled that game as if K-State wins that game, um, you're probably looking at a, a, a just as successful as a season as last year. I, I think that game will tell us a lot about this team. So I'll say Oklahoma State. 
as much as I want to say Troy, like you said, it's just it's too early on the schedule for it to be considered a trap game. I think that case it's going to be a tough game, but I don't think it's. I think that the players and the fans, I think, can look at it and realize that and say, yeah, it's it's going to be a tough game. But I agree with Fitz. I think it's UCF. Just I think it's it's weird because it's UCF's first Big Twelve game, mm-hmm. and if you're from the K State side, it still probably feels like a non-conference game. It feels like a fourth non-conference game. You'll play at Mizzou. You know, I, I'd argue that the UCF game will feel more like a non-conference game than the Mizzou game. I think, you know, you look back at just the history K-State's had with Mizzou. I think that K-State wins that game handily, but I just, I feel like the UCF game's just going to feel kind of like a fever dream, I guess, for probably fans and players. It's just not exactly what everyone considers Big 12 football at the moment. I think that can change, and it will change, but for the moment, it just it doesn't feel 100% correct in the head. It's just it's tough to look at it and recognize, yeah, that's a Big 12 game. You got to, you know, you got to be on your marks at that point. Right. It just, it's I think it's it's going to be a tough one. And then you have the bye week right after. So it's just it's kind of a weird a weird thing. Stand just, alone. Yeah, just it kind of stands alone as kind of the finale of September and kind of the the non the non conference season. It just that's the way it feels to me. Mm-hmm. I'd agree with that. Okay. All right. Next question from Big Sam. I have seen K State's football schedule, quote unquote, ranked. He says by one website as the tenth toughest this year. If this is accurate, does this put a damper on your hopes for a repeat K State as Big Twelve champions? I'd also like to add, guys, that I've also seen K State ranked as having the twentieth easiest schedule that I literally just saw on Twitter today by some other publication. So was it a real one or was it like big game boomer? No, it was, it was ranked by, you know, like some metric, you know, okay. that they, they decide to rank the schedules, but uh, let's be honest. Sam it's neither one question. of those. No. no, I mean, it's, it's not in any way an easy schedule. You're going through a competitive big 12 schedule. An easy schedule is when you have four automatic wins on your schedule, like in the Big Ten or the Pac-12. Or the SEC. Yeah. Let's just be honest. These conferences are really strong at the top. In some cases, not the Pac-12 necessarily. Um, But there's just a lot of easy games on there that if you don't screw up, you're going to win. That's not true in the Big 12. Dana Holgerson brought it up. When I was here, it, the first time he said at West Virginia, there was an easy game. It was Kansas, but that's no longer easy. He didn't say Kansas, but we all know what he was saying. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it's a battle every night. So no one in this conference has one of the easiest schedules in the country, although I'm pretty intrigued by the schedule that Oklahoma built and um, then got help, help from the Big 12 scheduling. How that's not showing up on easiest schedules is beyond me. It is easy. Um, But it's also Kansas State's schedule isn't one of the toughest in the country. Yeah, they play Texas and Texas Tech and TCU. But, I mean, I guess – I I, I think it's manageable for K-State. I think it's it's a schedule that I think some people are saying it's tough because they're undervaluing K-State. Mm-hmm. The bottom line here is we don't know any of the metrics behind how they're right. they're coming to these conclusions. And some human put in all the metrics. So you can say a computer did it, but someone decided what's valuable and what's not. Period. I, K-State's got a challenging schedule. Is it one of the toughest in the country? I don't accept that. And it's certainly not an easy schedule by any fair measurement. It's not an easy schedule, but because of K-State's ability, I don't think we look at this and say that it's a hard schedule. No. Like I think you could realistically make an argument for K State to win twelve games on the schedule. Like you could realistically make an argument as an individual game. You could go through each game, you know, regardless of you know l- sitting here and picking each game. If this happens and this will happen and this will happen and this will happen. If you just compared K State to the team they're playing against, you could say that they would have a chance to win all twelve of those games. Am I right on that? Yeah. So yeah, I, I but that's this, also why you play the games. No, yeah. I agree with that, but that's why I don't accept this, that it's the 10th hardest schedule in the country. There's not a single game on here that I look at and say, I can't see K-State winning this game. And there is yeah. some games like that for other Big 12 schools where you're like, like if you go through and look at it, when K-State plays, um, you know, Baylor, like that's a game I look at. I just can't see any way, like on paper right now, 
where Baylor would be better than Kansas State at home in in Manhattan. I, that, that can't be said for K-State. There's no game like that for K-State where you say there, there's no way they win that game. Let's look at the changes, though. The Kansas State lost Oklahoma um, and replaced it with UCF. I think on the field this season, those are pretty comparable. I recognize that the voters had Oklahoma higher in the poll, but I'm not sold on Oklahoma being that good. Now, they might finish that way in the poll because the schedule I'm about to read you. But on the other end of it, you pick up Houston and replace it with West. You lose West Virginia and replace it with Houston. West Virginia's picked for last. How, you, you got bet stronger in that. This Oklahoma schedule is astonishing uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the Big 12 was so kind to them, but they do not play a power five in the non-conference. Oklahoma, the mighty Oklahoma Sooners didn't bother to schedule a power five school. Was this year when they had an SEC school on their schedule? Maybe Tennessee, but yeah. look, I think they could have found one. Mm -hmm. I think they used that as an opportunity Brent Venables looked back in his history and said, well, Bill Snyder didn't used to do this. I, I need the wins. I think they just scheduled wins here. They could have found someone. Arkansas State, SMU, Tulsa. They open the Big 12 uh, at Cincinnati, and then they get to play Iowa State. Two of the worst teams in the Big 12 this year. Then they play Texas. And then they have UCF coming in. And then they go to Kansas. And then they go to Oklahoma State. Then they have West Virginia. This is such an easy schedule for them. I've seen maybe two losses so far. Um, they go to BYU, and then they close with TCU. And uh, If they're not a 10-win team this year, this is this program's in trouble. But as I said, they went 6-6 six and six last year before the bowl game, and they lost that. But if they're 8-4 and four this year, it's completely comparable to the 6-6. Six and six. Mm -hmm. This is an easy schedule. Um, and it falls, you know, right into Brent Venable's lap. He can now maybe make up some ground and get some momentum. But I just think it's funny. Mighty Oklahoma get, has to schedule down to fix itself. I think they lose a non-con game. I think I'll I think, laugh my ass off if they do. I think Arkansas State and SMU are not laughable group of five programs. And Tulsa's taken them to the wire multiple times. And that game is in Tulsa. Really? Are they playing that on the campus? Yeah. 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 So how is that going to work? Because that is a tiny, tiny stadium. If you're Tulsa, it's you hope fun. you sell all the tickets to your fans. But you know Oklahoma will buy those seats. Yeah. I mean, both Oklahoma schools have played at Tulsa. They play at Tulsa Oklahoma fairly State regularly. Did. Yeah, yeah. Now, Oklahoma State played the one the game that went to 3 in the morning or something. Yeah, started at midnight. That was when I was a student there. Hmm. That was a weird watch on television in the even, dorm room. Even past your bedtime. Yeah. That's a late bedtime. Nice. All right. Are we ready for the next question? Mm -hmm. Next question. Last one of the first half comes from Power Cat Ryan. Ryan. Where does Will Howard finish on the all-time passing touchdown list after this season? And for some context, would we like some context? Yes. Okay. Will Howard is 11th currently on the list with 24. Uh, Brian Cavanaugh at 25. Lynn Dickey at 29, Colin Klein at 30, Jonathan Beasley at 33, Chad May at 34, Michael Bishop at 36, L. Roberson at 37, Jake Waters at 40, Skylar Thompson at 42, and Josh Freeman at 44. How many touchdown passes does he have? If he throws 21, he is the all-time passing touchdown leader. If he throws 21... He should be able to throw a 21 touchdown pass. Oh. This year. Right? I mean, he threw 15 last year, and that was in six games. Huh? Good point. Yeah, I think he does it. He will be number one. It's actually kind of crazy. I didn't even realize the, that he was right there. It will well, be like the 11th game. Doesn't this show, does though, the, the evolution of the game, how much more passing there is and end zone situations. I mean, Lynn Dickey was a prolific passer, but they scored fewer points and they ran the ball when you got in the red zone. You want to know something crazy? The all-time leader for passing touchdowns at Kansas State has 44 career touchdowns. Last season. In three years. In three years. Last season, Caleb Williams for 42. 
Yeah, that's crazy. That's Jake Waters. Jake Waters at third on this list is the most impressive. Two seasons, right? Two seasons, forty touchdowns. In in a time where it was Bill Snyder and they ran the football. No, they had, had Tyler, had Lockett. Tyler Lockett. Okay, well, and Curry Sexton who closed out. Sure, yeah. it, but in an era where it was more yeah. of you know, like imagine if you know those guys were on the roster today, he would he would probably be at like sixty. Yeah. Um, that it's a good question. I just hate stats questions. I I'll guess yes. You think he'll finish first? Yeah, as, as long as he stays healthy. Yeah, that's the big thing. I guess the next question is with the way the game is going, how long does that record hold? Well, it depends on how many years the next quarterback has. If he's a guy that has four years of eligibility and probably doesn't fit the norms of an NFL quarterback body and he can stay healthy, he might throw a lot more than that, but he also might run quite a bit. I think it's, I just think that if Jake waters can be third in two years and four touchdowns off the all time record and five to have it outright, I think that Avery Johnson might have it by the end of his second season. How did Skyler not take this throne though? Kept getting injured. The dude was here for eight years. Yeah, Kept getting injured. I guess, man. He also ran for a lot of touchdowns too. Skyler did. Yeah. I think it's pretty remarkable when you look at Will the fact that he did throw fifteen touchdowns this season and and he threw eight touchdowns as a true freshman. I think people kind of forget that he had some some statistics that season that weren't all that terrible, but he also threw ten interceptions as a freshman, which I think people remember more. Yeah. I agree. So. That's it for the first half, isn't it? Yep. Wow. That flew by like a conversation with an old friend. Oh, whatever. We'll be back after this break. GoPowerCat.com's PowerCat podcast continues after this short break. Selling a little or a lot. Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage, to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage. Shopify is here to help you grow, whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits. Shopify helps you sell everywhere, from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify has got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 15% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning 24-7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash odyssey podcast all lowercase go to shopify.com slash odyssey podcast now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in shopify.com slash odyssey podcast welcome back to the power cat podcast now let's return to the gpc studios Welcome back to the PowerCat Questions Podcast, sponsored by Fridge Wholesale Liquor, the finest and largest liquor store right here in Manhattan, Kansas. Oh, I love it so much. Tim Fitzgerald, that's me, Zach Carlson to my left, Cole Carmody to my right, Dogs to my farther left, and we're all here in the GPC studio thinking of Ryan Gilbert. Okay, we're done thinking about Ryan Gilbert. Let's go on with your questions from Wildwest Station. Here's Cole. From PowerCat, Ryan, once again, to start off the second half. This is a good, this is good and interesting question. Can oh, football, more stats. It is. Can football and men's basketball get more than 550,000 people through the turnstiles in 23-24? As a follow-up, how much can women's basketball and volleyball increase with the hype in the new volleyball arena? Uh, for some, some numbers here, 521,289 was the combined for football and basketball last year. So it's only... Roughly 38 
thousand off. But if you look at the capacity, K State football was a thousand over capacity last year on tickets. People through the turnstiles, and then basketball was about fifteen hundred off from a sellout each I, game. I don't see how you pick up thirty thousand more. Am I? Yeah, just... I mean, you, you can. You just literally need to sell out every basketball game. Well, right. And we're talking attendance. They need to show up. That let's let me call this out. You can't have capacity above your capacity. That is one of the silliest things ever. We all know Bill Snyder Family Stadium has an actual seating capacity in excess of 50,000. But they just rounded it down. I mean, in Granite, you sell standing room only tickets now that have become a valuable part for a lot of fans of getting into the stadium. But it's still part of your capacity. Mm -hmm. For me, capacity is the number of beyond which the fire marshal shows up. Exactly. That's trouble. exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. That's How... the capacity for me. <laughs> so, I, and the same with Bramlage. They've rounded it down, but I'm sure it's a little bit higher than what they say. So the reality of this question is, will Kansas State sell out more than 90% of all basketball and football games? Is that is that in essence what we're asking? I mean, it's more how many extra people can K-State get in to football games to give K-State basketball enough of a cushion <laughs> to not have 11,000 people for a couple non-conference games. Well, we should know the answer to this pretty soon, pretty early in basketball season. It's those non-conference games, those pre-Big 12 games that are usually the ones not attended as highly. And maybe there were some early Big 12 games before people had caught on to this Jerome Tang thing was real and tangible that would have higher capacity now, I mean, higher attendance. As for the women's basketball and volleyball questions, I, I think they're they're good. Let's not forget K-State has had a history of, of filling Bramlage for women's basketball, and this is going to be an extremely talented team and might be very entertaining to watch. So I think that will go up. I think they need to spend some time courting the the senior community in this town and and the grade schools. That's that was traditionally their audiences before. They had a lot of young female um, athletes that wanted to come to women's basketball games because it was inspiring, and you know honestly it was great entertainment for you know, citizens that can't spend the kind of money you have to spend to f for men's game. Volleyball, I'll be really intrigued with their attendance is. I know I want to go to a game to see it in that that venue, um, and I think a lot of other people will feel that way. So now it's up to the new coaching staff to put a product out there that will get people back. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of up to them. I think the hype is real for women's basketball. I agree. So I don't know how many people will go, but I will say that when they played Iowa last year and they had that double header, I thought it was – Brilliant, because you got people in for the men's game, and then there were some people that decided, you know what, I'm just going to stick around. We'll just stay for the first half. You know, mm -hmm. they'll warm up. We'll stay for the first half, and then we'll go home. Oh wait, K State's winning. Well, we got to stay for the second half. So I think they should do some of that doubleheader more. I think it would really increase the uh, the energy for the for the women's game. And really, what they need to do is do Friday Sunday series on a home football weekend. Yeah. Play on a Friday they night. Need, yeah, they need to play more Friday. Like, not just like Emporia State on Friday night. They need to play good opponents. And you can do men's and women's, you know, Sunday afternoon. You know, play men's game Friday night. You got football game Saturday. Sunday at noon or Sunday at 1. Play a game against Michigan State. I don't know. Yeah, you know, bring somebody huge in. And same goes for the women's side, too. Just make it a massive weekend that people can come in agreed very good all right gene taylor if you're listening to this podcast make sure oh, you I'm sure yes yeah of course totally uh next question comes from americat how would you compare the depth of this year's football team to past years it seems like they aren't as shallow across the board as they sometimes are no well, i've got concerns in the secondary and and nose tackle but certainly not the line offensive line not the end I think linebacker, they're actually pretty good mm -hmm. when you throw in some of the young players they're talking about. So, you know, you just, anytime you get injuries, it seems to attack a position. And it did safety last year, which isn't 
probably going to be uncommon in this defensive formation. You put a lot of physical stress on your safeties, a lot of run support. Um, but yeah, I, I think they're finally building the depth. And, you know, you go back to when Coach Snyder retired, the depth was atrocious. It was just razor thin. I, well, hell, they didn't have any running backs on scholarship on the roster. And so it, we we as an institution, as a football program, we're headed to a dark spot. And so it's taken a while to turn that ship around and the whole COVID thing threw everything out. But he's persisted through that. And Chris Kleiman and his staff have done a good job of building up depth. But in this day and age of the portal, I don't know if you'll ever have the depth you want because you think you got it and then someone leaves. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to be how the game's played now, and you're going to be constantly fighting those numbers. And you better have some players that are adaptable to multiple positions because they might get forced into it. I look at if you go down on a position by position breakdown, you're more deep. You're deeper at quarterback, I think, this year from a from from a pure talent standpoint, that quarterback room is is super solid, and and I think the same can be said about the running back room. Right behind Deuce last year, the question was who, who's going to be the number two, and obviously DJ Giddens stepped up and and performed. But I think you have some other guys. You have at least at least two guys in, in DJ Giddens and Treshawn Ward that are capable of being number one backs. And then you throw in Joe Jackson into the mix, so I think it's a freshman who's going to do some really good things at the receiver position. You're miles deeper than you were last year offensive line i would agree um obviously you're extremely deep there so your whole entire offense is deeper this year than they were last year and that's off and that's that's coming off of an offense that was pretty dang good last year so i think you got to feel good on offense defensively i would agree fits the linebacker position might be the most deepest part of that defense maybe even on the entire team um i do worry about the defensive line as a whole just a little bit you know i I mentioned this before we started recording but i went back and watched some of that big 12 championship game and uh, the the attention was on felix the entire game and he still found ways to make plays so how is brendan mott and nate matlack how will they step up in absence of him will be very key. I know you get Khalid Duke back, but there's going to be an adjustment period there. So I, I, I look at that defensive line as maybe a little bit thin on depth and obviously the secondary. They like what they have. They're going to be young. There's a lot of uh, guys that are around the same ability in the secondary, if that makes sense. I think you can plug and play with some of those guys. Um, how good are they going to be? I don't know. But I think the defensive line is something we're not talking about enough. I still look at losing Julius Prince and Echo Boido at corner and just saying, you know what? I don't really know how deep you could possibly be there when you lose when you lose, sure. you know, two solid guys, two like NFL that. guys, yeah, two NFL yeah. guys. So that's probably where I'd say the most shallow. But I, but I agree. I think that K State feels very deep in most places across the board where there's going to be a lot of drop off from the number one to the number two. You know, I think that there's a lot of equity you know there's they're pretty equal in a lot of positions where sure. you know the next man up is not going to be as much of a drop off as it was you know even two or three years ago okay all right very good good questions good conversation uh next question uh, i believe this is the first time we've ever had this person ask a question. well maybe you but you don't come on the podcast very often oh. gillen fan has been around mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sorry, Gillum fan. From Gillum fan 67663. Do that you is think. the proper zip code, by the way. Thank you. Mm. Do you think Thursday slash Friday night games will really elevate the viewership of any Big 12 team significantly? I'm here for it for what it's worth, but it really brings the Saturday hype down if your favorite team isn't on. Saturdays are for college football. He says, I feel the same way with the NFL on Thursday night. I agree with all that. But I also think this is a reality. It it, it puts you on a bigger stage. Now, we got to understand this. <clears throat> as, as I pointed out for many years, there's a self-fulfilling prophecy in what teams get selected for not just the best time slots, but more importantly, the best platforms. Mm-hmm. If you're on ABC or CBS or in the case of Notre Dame and now the Big Ten NBC or the ESPN platform, you're at a huge advantage even over ESPN2 and certainly over – um, I guess I left out Fox in that whole scenario. And, and certainly over, um, you know, FS1 or ESPN, anything else. It's just a big deal. So if you have to play on a Thursday night, and I'm a I'm much more in favor of Thursday than Friday nights for because of high school football. But if you have to play on one of them and it gets you on an ESPN platform, then I'm all for it because more people will watch. People are 
have viewing habits of those stations that are hard to overcome. That's why I keep telling Pac-12 people, well, you just can't reinvent viewer habits because we moved to Apple and everyone's going to follow us. That's not how viewer habits work. It's going to take you a while, and that while will probably put you under. So I understand why they're doing it. I get it. They're trying to get onto the big stage more often, show that the brand of football is very entertaining, even if it's – I'm going to pull two teams out. If it's Cincinnati at Texas Tech, it's going to be a fun game. Even if there's no rivalry there, it's going to be an entertaining football game because the league is so competitive. So I just think it's a a function of doing business, and until they can earn their way to to get more of the quality time slots and platforms – then you got to do it. And I'm, I'm not real happy about Friday night football because I am a big fan of high school football, but it's just part of doing business right now in this world. I'll, I'm just going to say this. I don't think people in Kansas understand how big of a deal Friday night football is in Texas. Yeah. Like we think it's a big deal in Kansas and, and there's no doubt from, especially from these smaller towns, the town shuts down and they go to the games. But it is an event in Texas. Yeah, it I mean, is an event in Oklahoma. It's not an event like that in Kansas. I, it, maybe it is for and, – and maybe this is not. my Kansas City coming out of me. But there's people that – oh, the high school's playing? Okay, well, I'll watch it on TV. Unless their kid is playing, unless they have family members that are playing, or unless you're just an alumni that lives in the area that has gone to the games for forever – you're not going to consistently go to high school games every single week like they do in Texas. If K-State is playing and a K-State fan wants to come to the game on a Friday night, they will come to the game on a Friday night as opposed to going to a high school game that they would normally go to. That's just the reality of the situation. I'm sorry. It sucks. I get it. I really do. But, like, I compare this exact to when the Royals were in the playoffs and were playing on Friday nights. Like, the stadium was still sold out. People will still go to the games. Like you're talking about the Royals? Yes. Yeah. I mean, college football is going to be the bigger event. It's going to win every time over uh, over high school football, at least in Kansas. But to your point about Texas, it's not just the football players. It's the bands. Mm-hmm. Halftime takes 45 minutes because both bands will play a full halftime show. It takes forever to play a high school football game in Texas. Quite frankly, I find it annoying that it's a whole event just to see what 48 minutes of football. It is annoying to watch high school football in Texas, but that's, that's a whole nother aside. Uh, but and Keisha tweeted this out last week and I kind of pushed back on it. Just play the game. If, if K state or KU has to play on a Friday night, move games to Saturday. And that was your idea. And you can, I like well, stolen from me. Stole from from you. Okay. You can play games on Saturday. You can make it where you can play games on Thursday. Quite frankly, a lot of teams in big school districts where they share they stadiums, that. they play games on Thursday. They play on a six day week. It they sucks. do that in the playoffs. In 4A, for the longest time, you play yep. a Thursday game, you play a Tuesday game, you play a Saturday game. You're playing short weeks when you have extra teams for the playoffs. Sorry, but that is what it is. But I think that I don't I don't like Friday night games just because it's it's the worst time slot. Friday night, whether it's college football or not, Friday night's not a night where nobody's you're, home. You're watching TV right. in the fall typically. I mean, it's it's the worst night for scripted television, you know, sitcoms, whatever. You know, Friday night is not a a TV night for for most people. But I think that Thursday night is absolutely the best. It is my favorite time slot for college football because you're typically the only game on. I mean, really, you should treat it like Monday Night Football. It is, granted, it's at the beginning of the week versus, you know, the last game of the weekend. But you were against nothing in college football. Maybe a game on FS1. But if you were on that ESPN 6 o'clock spot, that that's your time slot. You, I think the Big 12 should absolutely own it. And, you know, obviously, if you're playing on Thursday, the league and these teams won't buy weeks before. And the way you can kind of do that is just you play a Friday night game. You know, you go Saturday, Friday, Thursday, and then, you know, you've got a Saturday off to where you kind of have a built-in bye week. It takes three weeks, three three weeks of football to do it. To, and, and I wouldn't say that you play, you know, 
two home games on weeknights. I think that you can protect against that. But I think the proposition of playing games on weeknights is not a bad proposal. You know, if you're the home team on Friday, you're going on the road on Thursday and, and vice versa. I think that you can make Thursday and Friday games work really well in this league, especially when you have seven conference games a, a week. You need you need to get your brands on national television and and putting them at times where you're not competing against anybody else is great. And kind of to the point of Thursday night football and like what Fitz said about viewing habits, you know, Amazon Prime was great. I enjoy watching the games mm -hmm. on Amazon Prime, but at the same time, you, you're changing viewing habits. And I was more interested in watching some bad NFL games. The, these NFL games were horrible on Thursday nights. That's why I think you need to play every – like make Thursday night the night for Big 12 football. Yeah. Why not do should, a doubleheader? You, I mean, I don't know about a doubleheader, but at 6 o'clock every Thursday night, you should be putting sure. your best – you should try your best to put your best football game on Thursday night. One of the best. You know, one of them. Yeah. Because, you know, especially if you can get, you know, obviously these Thursday night games like Oklahoma State, or well, Friday night this year. But my, my point is these weeknight games, you announce the, the TV time and the TV station well before the season starts. You know the time slot already. You know the bye weeks. If you want a marquee matchup, let's say K-State TCU. Put that on Thursday night football. I mean, why not play that on a Thursday night? Give the two teams bye weeks. You have the best, you know, potential. Obviously, it's the, the rematch. Put it on Thursday night. That is must-watch college football TV. I'm sorry, but you have to play on Thursday nights. I agree. Can you match it up when the NFL releases their schedule and the Panthers and the Falcons are playing on a Thursday night and say, we're going to put K-State and TCU on that night, and we're not going to beat the NFL because nobody beats the NFL, but we will steal some viewers. But when you're on ESPN and NFL's on Amazon, it's a lot easier of a of a call to make and say, hey, we're going to own, the, own TV. Right. I agree. I agree. All right, are we ready for the last question? I am. From Wildcat Pilot 88 Fitz, this is basically just for you, so oh, Zach and I will okay, take right. our headphones off and listen. Uh, there is still no TV deal for the Pac-12 before their media day this week. If this were happening to any other Power 5 conference, what would be the result? Right, let's put the emphasis on media day, right? It's a 12-team conference <laughs> that is doing it all on one day. The SEC has four, right? They just, they just are doing Monday through Thursday. Maybe some of them are short. Big 12 did two short days, but it was still two days. Yeah, underlying here is you can tell by the way the, the conference is constructed and how the fans react to news that they just don't really know about college football. What's going on in the Pac-12 media rights thing is not just comical. It's kind of unprecedented. We've never seen a conference go through this kind of public struggle and flailing about. And I, I can't wrap my mind around, you know, the most rabid Pac-12 fans still believing that they're going to get a better contract than the Big 12. You know, just I understand your hope your optimism, but if you just do the slightest bit of research, you're going to find out that the, their problem is there's nothing available. They have to create new opportunities with an Apple or something else. Maybe ESPN will come in and buy on the cheap. Well, we've got new bidders that weren't there a year ago. Well, those bidders aren't coming in now because they want to give you too much money. They're coming in because the price is so low, they feel like they can pick up a product for the cheap. Yeah, it's just it's almost gone from comical to just sad at this point how awful the Pac-12 has managed. And I'm not talking about commissioners. I'm talking about the presidents and chancellors that choose the commissioners. They don't understand college football. They don't understand college athletics. They don't understand the role of college athletics. And you can tell if they really went to the negotiating table demanding $50 million per school – it shows how naive and out of touch they really are. There's not that kind of value in the conference. There just isn't. And when you make an outlandish proposal like that, it doesn't start a process of negotiations. It starts a process of, screw you, I'm not going to discuss this. If, you, if we're that far out of alignment, there's no purpose of going forward. And we saw Fox do that. Fox was so in and out of those negotiations, it was pure comedy. 
Hopefully it comes to a conclusion at some point. And I admire the schools that are still hanging on, hoping for a good deal. But uh, eventually the Big 12 window will close. And if you're more determined to stay out west with other western schools and take far less money, then don't be confused by the result of you just don't have great football programs anymore. You just won't. How many more times do they delay? It's just unbelievable. They just delay and delay and delay. I've never seen anything like this. Because the money and the the viewership just isn't there. They're they're not going to be on enough um, linear viewing opportunities for them. To get kind of back to the question, if this was happening in any other Power 5 conference, I don't know. If it was happening in the Big 12, everyone would be laughing. Right. It would be the same. Right. Uh, if it was the S- if it was the ACC, I think that people wouldn't be laughing as much of well, you're obviously going to get picked apart. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it'd be kind of what the Big Twelve's doing with the Pac-12. Well, here you're going to go here, you're going to go here, you know, and that's and that's that. But I think if it was the SEC and the Big Ten, I don't think that it'd be a big deal. No, I think if they'd the just SEC be like, well, we're looking for the most money. Our Big Ten walked in and said, we're not going to take anything less than $100 million per school. They'd probably get the same pushback. We, we can't make money off of that. But you're, you're right. This story is tamped down simply because the rest of us, as much as we're interested in the Pac-12, because it does have ramifications for the Big 12, the rest of college football doesn't care. Can I just say it's two? There's only one good team out of that conference. Like, really? I mean, there's really one good team. So, like, I know that that doesn't necessarily have a major uh, – I don't I, – there's really no ramifications for being good on the field and – having this kind of business side impact it. But like the casual fan will look at this and be like, well, USC is good, but everybody else sucks. So I really don't care. Like that is a casual fan's perspective. Am I wrong about that? that? Even though Utah's good, they, they don't move the needle nationally no. because when they step out of conference, they're not good. You just look around that conference. You've got in the past few years, you've got Cal, Stanford, Colorado, Arizona and Arizona State that have not been competitive. And I still think schools such as Oregon State and Washington State would be at the bottom of the Big 12 and they're not even in that list. And UCLA has historically not been as right. not been as competitive either in the last what 10 years? Maybe not historically. But Lately they have not sure. been as good as what they should be, but right. We give them a pass, I guess. I, know. I mean, when you really boil it down, there's there's four football programs that are worth something as football programs in that conference, at least as of right now. And that's USC, Utah, Oregon, and Washington. And Oregon is finding out that conferences don't want to deal with Phil Knight. They're not as attractive. Well, we have Phil Knight. We have Nike Man. Well, no, nobody wants Phil Knight in the me- meeting rooms. They don't want him constantly calling to get his way. Mm-hmm. You're not Texas. They'll put up with Texas. We've already seen the SEC bow down to Texas. Unbelievable. Next year's media event for the SEC will be in Dallas. Just crazy. They love them a hotel. Oh, my gosh. Where, do we know where they're going to be? The Omni. They're just going to be at the Omni. I think so. Okay. Yeah, not at AT&T. <laughs> I don't know. Poor, poor Pac-12. But at least they're in Vegas on Friday. So after they don't have a media deal, all the bosses can, can go out and just get wildly drunk and do inappropriate things and, and pretend that they know what they're doing as mm-hmm. leaders of a conference. That's it for this edition of the Powercat Questions podcast. We'll be back next week with another event answering your questions from Wild Bass Station. But don't miss the overtime. We're kind of running out of time for the overtime. I don't know how many more overtimes we have in us before we say, hey, it's August. Let's get focused on football. The overtimes now are spring and summer thing. Enjoy it while it lasts. That comes up Sunday, but we're done with this one. Thank you for listening to the Power Cat Podcast. Make sure you're subscribing to our show at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. PowerCat Podcast. All rights reserved. GoPowerCat.com.
With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked, temperature set, lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details. Rise and shine, football fans. This is Susanna Fuller from Morning Footy, a podcast part of the CBS Sports Galazzo Network covering the breadth of the global game. Join me, Nico Cantor, Charlie Davies, Alexis Guerreros, and guests every morning for the perfect blend of news, analysis, conversation, and exclusive interviews. If you love soccer, then look no further. We've got you covered for Europe's top five leagues, the W Gold Cup, the Champions League Knockout Stage, CONCACAF Nations League, NWSL, MLS, Transfer News, and much more. Download and follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere podcasts are found. Subscribe to Morning Footy.